But what do you pay for what you need? Commodities, right? All through centuries, there's different commodities we trade. In 2024, it's currency. In the United States, it's dollars. So why wouldn't the man of God stand up and tell you how to spiritually handle your money? What we need to do, what God's called us to do. Show us in Scripture how we're supposed to handle it, what we're supposed to do, right? So Pastor Scott has been doing that for years and years and years. It's definitely invested in me. I'm assuming it's also invested in you guys. I don't want to brag. I don't want to, but you know what? When Christy and I got married in 95, we did our taxes. Our income that year was finally surpassed by our tithe in 2023. So we tithed more last year than what we had in income when we first started coming here. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good. And it's not because of us. We've applied the principles in the Bible. We've been here under hearing the word of God. We've been applying what we've heard. So I'm back to the basics for you guys for today. Hope that's all right. But I talked to Pastor Scott a few weeks back, said, all right, Pastor, I feel like God showed me something. We were talking about the building, how much was left. I feel like God showed me something. Because he's been talking about doing more in 2024. All right, we're 30% of the way through the year, right? We still have some debt in this building. It's been great. I mean, the building, we have a great facility here. It costs a lot of money to do. People before us helped build it, helped renovate it. But how can we do more? How can we make this debt free? How can we go into 2025 with a ministry that doesn't owe anybody anything? We can just take whatever we bring in, whatever God prospers us with, to bring in to go straight to ministry stuff and not go to a bank to pay for what was done 96 or 2000 or a remodel we did in 2011 and we purchased a building up front. All those things are great. They've got to where we are, but we're still paying for things that happened years ago where God's called us to take care of here and now. So I believe that we should put a push to do that. So I told Pastor, I said, I want to come up here and talk. God wants you and you and you and you and me to be blessed. Not so we can be fat, but so we can reach people. We can touch people. We can do things. We can reach ministry. We can bring more people in here. I mean, there's still room for more people to come and join us here in this building on a Sunday morning. We're not to a point where we're overflowing in their standing room only. Not yet. Not yet. I believe it's coming. I believe it's going to come where we have to have a couple services on a Sunday morning to handle all the people. And it's not going to matter if there's standing room out there because there's still going to be power of God back there and there's going to be people shouting and hollering in the foyer because they're getting healed. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. We're moving that direction. So why can't we also move that way in finances? You know what? I believe each one of us can. So I want you first turn to 2 Corinthians 6. No, 9. My notes are wrong. Pastor, this is my notes too. It's not yours. <laughs> but this is, you know, this is Bible. It talks a lot about different things in here. 2 Corinthians 9. I'd like you to go to verse 6. So today I've got a children's version Bible because it says it a little bit different. But that's okay. It, it opens. We've heard these verses many times from here in King James, New King James. But let's bring it a little bit different. Verse 6. Remember this. The person who plants a little will have a small harvest. The person who plants a lot will have a big harvest. That's pretty simple when you think of a farmer. They're going to sow. If they sow a row of 10 different seeds and they've got a, a row of 10, they're only going to get a little small harvest. But now if they go plant hundreds and hundreds of rows, they're going to get huge harvest. We understand that. Our brains can comprehend that. Right? And then the next says, each 
Each one should give then what he has decided in his heart to give. He should not give if it makes him sad. He should give if he thinks he is, and he should not give if he thinks he is forced to give. God loves the person who gives happily. And God can give you more blessings than you need. Then you will also have plenty of everything. You will have enough to give to every good work. It is written in the scriptures, he who gives freely to the poor, the things he does are right and will continue forever. And it says, God is the God who gives seed to the farmer and he gives bread for food and God will give you all the seed you need and make it grow. He will make a great harvest from your goodness. So I just want to talk a little bit. That's just kind of the starting verse here. God wants you to be sowing because he wants you to reap. You've heard of a snowball effect, but can you picture that in your finances? What if you started giving and the giving got more and God blessed you with more so you could then give more? Maybe your expenses don't change. So now you've given and you've got an extra 10 this week. It doesn't seem like much, but what if you turn that around and sow that and did more? And then in a few months, now you have an extra 100 every week that you get to sow. What if you get to five years down the road, and it's like, God, I don't need all this extra, but I've got like an extra 500 every week that I can give you out of my check, and I still have plenty for me and what I would need for my family. What if you were there? What if you were there? What if I was there? He's going to supply seed for you. You ever have a handful of seeds and look at it and go, that's not going to feed me and do much? Sometimes that's what our extra might look like, or, or if we sacrifice a little and go, I sacrifice, but it doesn't seem like much here, God. But you trust the scriptures here, it's going to bring more and more. In Galatians 6, you know what, let's go ahead and turn Galatians 6. Verse 7 and 8 is where I'm going to start. So do not be fooled. You cannot cheat God. A person harvests only what he plants. Ooh, so you can't reap somebody else's harvest. You got It's based on what you do. So if he plants to satisfy his sinful self, his sinful self will bring him eternal death. But if he plants to please the Spirit, he will receive eternal light from the Spirit. This is, like I said, this is the, the children's version I'm reading on, a little different than what you might have in front of you. But basically it says, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. If you continue into verse 9 and 10, you also see that you can't, you cannot get to a point where you get weary while you're doing that good. Otherwise, you're not going to be there to reap. You, you could get tired of sowing. You can say, I've been doing this for 20 years now. God, where's my, where's, maybe you didn't sow into the right ground. Maybe some, I don't know all the situations. But in verse 10, it talks about if you have opportunity, you need to good, do good for all, especially in the church. All right, we talked a lot about sowing. But first, I'll tell you one of the principles that comes out of here, out of this church that's preached a lot, taught, Yes, giving, receiving, sowing, reaping, tithing too. Oh, some churches won't go there. Some people say, oh, that's all Old Testament. But if you really search it out, it was Old Testament. But when Jesus came on this earth and he said, the law, I'm not here to get rid of the law. I'm here to fulfill it. So what he said is everything that was Old Testament still applies and then some, and then there's more because Jesus came to earth. So we continue to do, and if you notice, he did as well. He made sure he went to the church. He made sure he gave his tithe. He even paid his taxes, blew his disciples away. He was like, what? We have to pay taxes too? But I thought you were going to, and he said, ah, go, go, Peter, go fishing. The first fish you get, take the money, pay our taxes. There's enough to take care of everybody. Just one fishing event. There's more than enough. 
for what we need. But first, first things first, Matthew 6, 33 talks about you've got to put first the kingdom of God first. And then all those other things will come. Sometimes you're like, how am I going to do that, God? My budget doesn't allow 10%. You start with where you're at. You work your way up to that 10%. I've been at a place where I was 10%. I've been at a place where I wasn't, where things happen, situations happen. We had to say, Pastor, my family's not quite at the 10% again. We had to back down because of this, this, and this. We're getting back there. And we, we did, and we got back there, and we got back to our full tithe again and said, all right, now, now we're under the promise of God in Malachi 3. And verse 10 says, you bring our tithes, all 10% of it, because of all our increase, according to Deuteronomy 14. And because of that, in Malachi 3, 8, it says, then you're not robbing God. What would you rob him of? He's got everything he needs. Robbing him of an opportunity to bless you. If you're a parent and you have extra sitting there and your kid is struggling, and say they're, they've got like this thing that's, okay, it costs them $1,000 to do this here and they, they can't do it. And you're like, I've got, a, I've got the 1000 sitting right here. I just give it. They won't ask but I've got it. And then, then through some way, your parent says to the kid, or the parent says to the kid, yeah, I've got a thousand, I can do it for you. Oh, no, 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 we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. No, no, no. You're robbing that parent of opportunity to bless the kid. Imagine that being God and you. So God's like, I got this. I got everything you need. I see you're broken. I see you have this need. You didn't ask me for it. Okay, fine. You know, the need's still there. It's still near there. Holy Spirit talks to you and says, you just got to ask. Oh, I don't want to ask. Don't want to ask. And God's like, you're robbing me of the chance to do this. Same thing with your tithe. What if you're not doing that tithe like you're supposed to? So Malachi 3, 11 and 12 says some different things that God wants to do for you. I'm just going to run down. I only have so much time. God wants to rebuke the devourer. For your sake. I don't know in your life if you have things that devour. He wants to keep that devourer from destroying your fruit. So you might have sowed seed, but what if the devourer is destroying your fruit while it's still in the ground? Hmm. What if you're not tithing? You're only doing, let's say, nine and a half percent. But then you're trying to sow extra two or three percent of your income to try to do that. That fruit is now available for the devourer to destroy. Because you've not put yourself in a covenant with God, he said 10%, the first 10% is mine, says the Lord. So you do that first. Put yourself right there. And then he's going to do that. And actually Malachi 3 says that God says to test him. Test him in that if he won't open up the windows of heaven over you because you hit that 10% that you were supposed to do. I'll continue. So God says he also wants to make your vine to bear fruit for you. So whatever it is that you're doing, he wants you to bear fruit. And it says he wants the nations to call you blessed. So you're going to be, your fruit's going to be so good. Your vine's going to bear so much fruit that the nations hear about it and call you blessed. Not just your neighborhood, not just people you work with or your family, the nations. So much so, he wants to make you a delightful land. To me, that means not only am I going to have this, but there's going to be an expanse of area that I have responsibility for. Not just me, little thing, but he's going to expand. That's what God wants for you. That's what he wants for me. So first thing you do before you sow, make sure you're tithing. You get to that. And now... I want you to start thinking about your giving, your sowing. All right? Galatians 6, we kind of talked a little bit about. But before that, it talks about how you have to examine your own work. Don't look at the people around you, but examine yourself and what you do. So we each have our own load that we bear. And that's what it says in that verse too. So when you're doing this, I wanted to challenge our church 
I'm tithing and offering. I wanted to talk about paying this building off. God showed me a cool idea. I've got some poster boards here with some stuff. But I really want you to think about this first. Where are each of you at? In the next couple weeks, I want you to take some time, pray. What more could you do in 2024? Think about how good God's been to you. What is it we do? We talk every week about, you know what, we're putting money into this mortgage. We're going to pay this building off. And we do. Every month we put money down and the mortgage starts getting decreased and decreased. But what if we just eliminated it in the next six months? What if we just said, you know what, let's do this. Let's draw a line in the sand and say no more. Mortgage and be debt free. Right? We want to be debt free from this mortgage. So it says here on the box, the mortgage amount. So it's over $2,100 a month. We've been paying that for years. This church brings in enough money to do that. We put money in here. People give to the building fund in their envelopes, their offerings. What if you were to do more? Each of us, what if we were to do more? I'm going to challenge each of you to do more. You know what? Pastors talk many times about what Dr. Sumrall used to say. First, you have to believe for a plain donut before you can believe for a seven-tier wedding cake. Some of us might not be a seven-tier wedding cake faith yet. You know what? Some of us might be at a dozen donuts instead of a single donut. You know? We all are our own level. We all have our own finances. We all have our own life we're living. But I'm going to challenge you in the next couple of weeks. And starting May 1st, I've got a proposal for all of us. Something I hope you're all going to get excited about. I'll show you in just a little bit. Building up some, some excitement for it. But you think about it. What if from May 1st to November 1st, we were able to pay this thing off? And in December, we could celebrate. Say, mortgage is paid off. Have like a little celebration around Christmas time. Why not? Usually, Doc Barkley comes in December. What if he was here for like a burning of the mortgage celebration or something like that? Wouldn't that be fun to know that you were part of it? And think about this. Would whatever you decide when you examine yourself and you say, God, I trust you to do something new in me for this next six months. What if that continued? What if it was a new business that brought in an extra thousand a month for you? What if that was something that just the first step of this snowball rolling towards your future? You know, what if, what if you've got, all right, you just got this huge raise that you didn't expect? I mean, you would expect it because you believe God for something, and then all of a sudden you got called in and said, we've been watching you. We've been seeing how you handle things, your character. Because of that, here, now you're going to be doing this. You're going to be getting this. Oh, by the way, we're going to pay you retrospectively back to when we noticed. Why not? Why don't we believe God for something like that? I'm, I'm going to challenge you. I've been in many times where it doesn't seem like something's there, but still trusted God, and all of a sudden, boom, this happened, or this opportunity happened, or God dropped this idea in for this. It's going to take you to be a tither first and then desire to be a giver like God is. Think of offerings. So if you're a tither and you give offerings, maybe you give 1% of your income. Maybe you give 5 or 10. Whatever it is, I'm going to challenge you to do more. Can I get a couple of you from front row? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take two. Uh, well, that one's not yet. Those two. So first, what Trevor has. This, I believe, is what God has showed me to do. If we can start believing for extra above what we already do for the building, I put down different level amounts, and in May, we'll have like a little paper you get to take home, bright fluorescent with the amount that you decide that God's going to stretch you to for doing extra. I don't know if everybody's at a 5,000 level. You know what? I put 25 down there for 25 weeks. 
so the kids could start believing for a dollar extra a week, whether it's extra chores they do or whatever, that they can believe for something. Because I want everybody involved. I want everybody in here to start prospering. So I've got this here set up. I don't know where you're at, what you're thinking. Maybe you have an extra thousand in the bank if you just do. But that's not what this is about. I'm saying, how can we challenge ourselves to trust God for more? So I put down just a list, a few things I thought of right away. What if you trusted God for, for new ideas? Maybe it's fasting meals and bringing your, the money. Maybe it's a new business idea. Maybe a side hustle you're doing besides your normal job. You know what? Maybe it's overtime you get. Maybe some, finding some extra money. You know, I, most of you that have been here a while remember Pat Parrott. She used to work at a truck stop gas station. She said, told God, anything you bring in here, she called it funny money. Anything that wasn't normal, silver dollar, half dollar, two dollar bills, all those. She said, anything you bring in here through the cash register, I'm going to exchange my money for it. I'm going to bring to the church and put to the building fund. She said it started out. Every couple weeks, she'd get a little something. Months down the road, she's like, I'm bringing like $20, $30 a week in here because I told God I would, and here it comes. And so God's blessing me because of it. You know, there's endless possibilities of what we can do because God wants to bless you in this. So next one. Here's to me told this one. So I want to challenge you guys with what if. What if for the next 26 weeks, you put an extra $10 in. You're doing right. That'd be $260. Okay. I've got a few different scenarios on here. We'll jump down to what if you gave up a $5 a day, whether it's an addiction or something that you just feel like you got to have, that you just do every day because of your habit. What if you told God for the next six months, I'm going to give that up. 180 days, that's $900 that you could sow. What if you're at the place, for instance, where you could just, God blesses you with big increase, and now your income is more than $100 more per week, and you could bring an extra $100 in per week. That's 2600 It may only seem like 100 every week, but it adds up. So six months, if we did all this here, like Trevor's board said at the bottom, if we add all that up, it's over $30,000. So based on the numbers of what we still owe, What's coming into normal, the normal, we don't, we're not going to quit doing what we're doing. This is all extra. And then we will pay this thing off by November, if not December 1st, the latest. So I just want to challenge you guys. And do I get to speak next week too? All right. So, no, thank you. I don't like speaking in front of people, but I'm here because. We really need to do this. I really believe that 2025 is going to be a huge year for this church. Why? I don't know. But we need to be debt-free to do it. Whatever it is that's coming, we need to be debt-free ready to do it. And we need to have more income rolling in. So when those other things come up, we can say, Pastor, we got it. This doesn't have to be a six-month drawn-out thing next time. Maybe it'll just be, hey, we need this to do this. And, you know, next week, bring in the offering. And maybe it's just that quick. I don't know. I believe God's got more for us. And I think there's more people that need to be involved. I think some of your friends and family need to start seeing you increase. And you say, you know what? This spring, I was challenged. And so I decided to do more, and I'm going to bring more to the church. We're going to pay off our church and be debt-free. And because of that, God's been blessing me. Now you see why the extra is here. God's going to bless you. He's going to use you as a highlight. He's going to use you and your life to point to him. Go ahead. Thank you. So with that, I don't know if you've got your offering envelopes, what you're doing now. Remember, starting in May. Starting in May, we're going to do this. I've got more notes. I've got more stuff I can talk about. But I just want to get that point to you guys. 
We need to look at ourselves, what we do. In the United States, the main commodity we use for getting things and buying things is our money. And God is interested in that. He wants to see us blessed. If you notice one of one of the top topics that Jesus talked about in the, in the New Testament when Jesus was talking was about sowing, reaping, about your money. Why is that? Because it's important. It's important. So hopefully you have your offering ready, your tithe. We can do this right now. I know there's an online way you can give right now, so that's good. Go ahead and stand your feet. We're going to pray. Go ahead and bring up your offering in a minute. I thank you, God, right now for what you're doing in this church, for what you're doing with New Life Victory Church and every person that's committed here and giving. God, I thank you. Those that are already doing stuff, I say, God, continue to bless and prosper them. You know what? Even before there was the Abrahamic covenant and there was the Moses covenant, you know what? You prospered those people who were giving tithe, that were sowing seed. And because that is a principle you've put in place years and years and years ago, and we just say, God, it never failed. It never failed. Even the farmers understand that with seeds. Right now, there's farmers in business because they know if they put a few seeds in the ground, they can reap that harvest. Now, if we can just put that principles into our life, God, show us where we can. Show us where we're at, what we can do. And show us new ideas, God. I ask you for opportunities for every person in here. Whether it's a new business, whether it's a, a side hustle, whatever it is, God, where, you know, somebody says, you know, they never give us overtime, but they did. Whatever it is, God, I say make your people so prosperous, God, that in a, in a few months, even before the six months are up, pastor can say, wait, 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 stop. We've got more than enough. Just like when Moses was there and they were said, we've got to take up a special offering to pay for this tabernacle to get this done. And he had to tell the people, stop, back up, hold on, hold your stuff, too much stuff. We don't have enough room for all that that you're bringing in. It is way more than enough. God, I believe you for that now for each of us. And we say, God, we're, we just want to be blessed so we can be a blessing, so we can reach people. Show us ways to reach more people too, God, through all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and bring up your tithe, bring up your offering. Right now, you still put change in here, money, dollar bills, goes right to the... That's serious? I was told we have a member of our church that eats tacos in a very unconventional way. Cam. Or maybe he's eating them the right way. Is that why you're much bigger than I am? I've been eating tacos wrong? Explain to the congregation now And that works for you? You don't have to go back for seconds. <laughs> what do you think of that, Susie? <laughs> Eat your tacos any way you want to? Well, Taylor Dendel eats her tacos. She gets her shell and puts all the fixings in it and then puts the meat on top. But that's still slow. You're, you're, you're a production guy. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, Father, thank you for tacos. And thank you for every good thing you've put in this world and in our lives. We like them, but we love you. And so I pray today that the blessing of the Lord that makes one rich and adds no sorrow with it will come upon us and come through us. And in the name of Jesus, I bless your people coming and going from the smallest thing to the greatest thing in their life. I thank you for supernatural activation by the Holy Spirit. And I thank you that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. I curse sickness and disease and I thank you for health and strength and wholeness. And I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you as we enter your word today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I give somebody a high five and tell them this. There's a miracle on the way. Kirsten, there's a miracle on the way, okay, for you. What? Go on. An unexpected raise. All right, you can be seated then. David, you got promoted today. You got moved up from the sixth row to the third row. I saw Missy walk right on by you and go like this. <laughs> Kirsten just told me she got an unexpected raise. Isn't that cool? Thanks for letting me know. Because now I can... You're already doing what Stephen talked about there. Stephen's got a raise too. Didn't you? You got a raise not too long ago? You didn't get fired, you got a raise. I like raises. Yeah, I like bonuses. I like surprises. I like God shaking up this, all our stuff. You feel like talking for a minute, Jeff? Tell me what happened this weekend at that men's conference. What hit you? Well, come up here first. You can't use those words Greg used, though. Well, you can use a lot of them, but there's two of them that... Wait a minute. Shirley Cronk's no longer here. We can use that word. No, I'm oh, kidding. No we're, not. no, we're not? There's a microphone right behind you. How many of you here know Jeff? <laughs> now, I love this guy. He taught me to ride motorcycles. He's on my speed dial for any automotive crisis, any time of day. I call him and say, here I am, come fix me and my bike and... I don't care if you're eating dinner or what you're doing. Or is there a call? You know, but I've never had to call you in the middle of the night. I appreciate that. But I was <laughs> it's because I'm not out in the middle of the night. Yeah, if you were calling me at midnight, I knew something was wrong then. <laughs> but if I got thrown in jail for some weird, weird reason, I'd say, hey, brother, just... We broke you out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got that time right, Bailey, but we'll get you out. Don't worry. <laughs> We went to the Muskegon men's meeting this weekend, and they had a, a Green Beret, former Green Beret guy that spoke that was a, just mind-boggling. So what'd you get out of it? Why would God send you all the way to Muskegon? One, one of the things I actually got out of it was everything I honestly needed. <clears throat> when you're walking around as a man, you think you have it all together when you really don't. Well, we as men put on a great facade, you know. Got this, don't worry about it. We can fix this. Give me a hammer. That one don't work. Give me a bigger hammer. So uh, over time, you know, listening to these mighty men up there, you find out that there's you are actually stronger with humility than you are brute force. You can, you can move mountains in prayer and humility, and you can have all the hammers you want. You beat that thing day in, day out, and it. It's not going to move. But with the power of Christ growing inside of us, we make things happen in the physical through the spiritual. That is the only way. Because right now, when you look at everything that's going on in our courts and mm. everything, right? Right now, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is going to be the power of our God that will turn this ship. And that is the only way because so far... We watched man try this and this and courts and blah, 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 man. The list goes on and on. But at this point in our juncture, this country, we need to get on our knees. We need to pray. We need to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, which is a name above every name, and turn this ship around. It's not just for us. This is, well, now I'm a grandpa, you know. So yeah. now this fight isn't just for me. This is going to go beyond me. This is for generations to come. We're calling it a revival. A revival here. <laughs> That's it. This city is turning. We're, this is the nucleus. This shot. This 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 has that shop, but this church, <laughs> this church here. Kind of a shop. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we do a lot of a lot of work in here. <laughs> some of it's surgery, some of it's mechanical. 
<laughs> but, but no matter how you do it, no matter how you look at it, there's only one way this is going to happen. And when I went up there, I definitely came back different than I walked up. Up there, I couldn't hardly play because my mind was still going all <laughs> through this stuff, you know. I was like, Zhoo. so I'm, I'm not the greatest speaker, but, but that's all I got for right now. All right. Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, you want to say something? Or, I mean, we're glad you got saved this at this conference. Maybe, maybe like renewed, but not saved. I've been saved for a long time. You've been saved? Yeah. I don't know when. Like, you got I mean, refreshed then or renewed. Here, so, yeah. What happened to you? Oh man, I wasn't prepared. Um, so I think I, that's I think, why I did it this way. <laughs> yeah. Too. Um, I don't know. I think the biggest thing is like looking at um, Greg Stubbe, the Green Beret that was there, um, and all the stuff he went through, and just thinking about like how small minded I think about my life, not personally, but like what I'm doing. Like it all has meaning to me, but in the real like scale of things, like there's so much more I could be reaching out to people here, reaching out to people in my work at school that like they need the help and they need the brotherly love to know that there's somebody out there that loves him. That's what Greg Stubbe said every single time he was up there. First thing he said, did I already tell you guys I love you? Did I tell you guys I love you? Like, literally every five minutes he wanted to say that because he loves everybody, and he wants everybody to have that love, that brotherly love with each other. And so he went through so many things. You guys should figure out the story. Ask one of the people that was there. They'll tell you about all the, you know, being on fire, his intestines being on the ground, all this stuff, you know, bad things he went through. <laughs> and then in that whole thing, you know, still having that brotherly love and learning to, like, the camaraderie of that. And I don't know. Yeah, he was big on that. I like that. Yeah, there's there's just a lot of things that I can look at myself and figure out what I need to do to grow myself. So, yeah. And without getting blown up, either. Oh, and on fire. No, thank you. Elijah, I'll stretch you here. You saw something. Well, he showed he showed pictures of his injuries. And uh, uh, I did. Uh, impro- what's it called? An improvised beat. Uh, IAD, blew up his home V, and he was the medic on the team. And he, he tried, the, the, it, the Hummer got tipped on its side, and they had to crawl out. And as he started to crawl out, he crawled out, but his leg stayed behind. And it was just hanging on by the skin, and then he noticed his intestines hanging out. And then he noticed he was on fire. And then the Taliban shot him two more times. And then he showed pictures of it. And then a piece of shrap metal blew through here and came out. Uh, if I can do a Forrest Gump, his, uh, his buttocks got blown up. And I could hear Elijah in the back. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Am I telling the truth, Andrew? This dude was real. He, uh... <laughs> that was, it was gory. It was. It was. It was. It was gory. But, oh, sir. Really, mandatory. We're going to get a bus. <laughs> How about if we get the tapes and we listen to it? And... That'd be good. Now, what I got from it was I know military people. I appreciate them, respect them. But I've also met some military people that were arrogant. Like one time I went, I had to do a hospital call. And I have these pair of Rocky boots. They're military. And they look good. They're comfortable. They're warm. They keep my feet dry. I remember getting in the elevator, and this guy walks in, and he's all, you know, military guys have this, most of them do, I shouldn't say all of them, but they, they're, they're dressed nice, they're, and he, this guy walks into the elevator with me, you know, I'm friendly, I said, what's up, how you doing? And he looked down at my boots, and he said, where'd you serve? I said, I've never been in the service. The guy turned his back on me. I thought, man, I guess I'm not as, what I should have done is say I'm a jarhead. Because I can be a jarhead. So there were military jokes all through the thing. That's a nickname for Marines. 
We got a couple of them over there. We got some Navy guys over here. We got an Army guy over here, right? And then we got Charity, who is Holy Ghost su Supernatural Special Forces. What? You? Oh, that's when you got arrested, right? And they made you go to boot camp. They called you maggots. Look at you now. Well, I'll pray about that, see if the Lord would have us do that. Uh, but anyway, he said he was, he'd been in the military since he was 19, and now he's in special forces. He had all these kind of honors and awards. And he said, we were just so full of ourselves and so arrogant and and we didn't need another person. And if we saw a flaw in another, in another soldier, we, we would distance ourselves from them or if they did it different than I did. And then he said, after, you need, you need an element of that to stay alive in the war zone, okay? But he said, after he came back, what how, was it, two-thirds of his intestines were removed? And, and he said, that, that would... Change the way you eat, don't you think? Don't you think that'd change the way you go to the bathroom? Change everything? <laughs> well, he, he said, here's this independent, arrogant, self-sufficient man. Now he's in the hospital for, what did he say, a year and a half? He, and he said the first several months, he was helpless. And he was totally dependent upon people he did not know. And he said, forgive, I'm just going to quote him. So I know it's Sunday morning church, but this is his story. He just said, because there was so much internal damage. Remember, he got burned. He had third degree burns on his rear end and on his legs. And he said, unexpectedly, this uh, horrible yellow fluid would come out of his butt. Unannounced, unexpected. And he could not move to clean himself up. So one of the hospital staff would come in and and he said it was the most humbling experience of his life. Don't you think? I mean, from a big I'll shoot you down soldier to, oh, but Doc Barkley fixed him. Doc Barkley said, I'll make no jokes about the army. There's no sense picking on the weak. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you think that was hilarious? You didn't really get it? And the Green Beret made some jokes about the Marines. But man, they were hard on the Air Force, I'll tell you that. They, uh, keep, yeah, keep the crayons away. That was hilarious. The Green Beret said, hide the crayons when the Marines get here because they'll eat them. It was good. It was good for all of us to be there, and I agree with Jeff. Every male that can make it up there should go and see that there, there's more room for improvement. And, and one of the things that blessed my heart was when he told the story about how his whole philosophy on life changed being dependent on somebody you don't know, and they're willingly helping you do this. Uh, I related to that because of our experience with Nick and all of his complications. I, I, I'm familiar with that. But he was impressed with the armor bearers. He said, there's a man here serving me that's never met me. And it's not that I need to be served. He just wants me to be free in what I'm doing. And I just thought, you know, we all learned that from Doc Barkley. I mean, I've if I've taken heed in ministry, I mean, I've been accused of hypnotizing people for their offerings. Now, Stephen, yeah, Stephen. <laughs> I, let, I let Vito come in and shake him down now. <laughs> you know why he was so cool saying that? He's experienced everything he said. He, I mean, the, I think the first offering Stephen had, it was a dollar bill, and it was crumpled up so tight, there was a tear coming out of George's eye as he squeezed that so hard. Like, give it, give it. But now look at him, he's, he's not... Doing, he's not telling you anything he doesn't do or hadn't experienced. 
I've, I've had some pretty big accusations about, you know, I, I preach heresy, I hypnotize, I, I don't know, I get a lot of credit for stuff. I'm a pretty simple preacher. Um, but one of the things that, that really somebody went nuts about was, I have my own personal body, bodyguard. I'm so important, I need a, my own personal bodyguard. And, and, the, and the Swedish Mexican in me says, I don't need no bodyguard. I can take care of myself. That was one of the first things I learned as a little boy whose dad was a Golden Gloves boxer. I know how to. So keep that in mind next time, okay? <laughs> I throw one punch now and go, oh, oh, everything's pulled. And uh, I don't need a bodyguard, but I have men that, that want to help me do whatever. I mean, I'm very capable of starting my car, taking my bag out to the car, doing this, doing that. But they say, I, I just want to help you. And it was, to be honest with you, one of the hardest things it took Kevy to get used to this, to come into this church was people wanted to help her. And she hears this single mom all these years, and she comes here, I can carry my own bag. Okay. And, and that takes me back to a statement I say about Kevy. You can take the girl from Battle Creek, but you can't get Battle Creek out of the girl. So every now and then, every now and then this, and all the Battle Creek people say, <laughs> uh, he was impressed with the ministry of helps, how they helped him, and he said, that's true humility. It's, it's really cool. And so I don't, I don't take it for granted, like today Corey will help me, and and for the record, if somebody does come up and grab me by the nap of the neck or by the throat, it will not end well for them. Because if Corey doesn't get to him, Todd will. Or Stephen will. I told you the story about the guy who threatened me in the lobby and all my ushers were so happy. It was like, oh, Christmas Day. <laughs> Just give me the wink, Pastor. I, I, I've been praying. One time... Forgive me, I'll get it to my sermon here in a minute. But One time, a guy came in and he sat over there like by where Matthew is. And he sat, and he sat there and he started, he started manifesting some demonic stuff. And so, of course I'm aware of it, you know. And so, I don't know, maybe he got, came here to get saved or whatever. Next thing I know, one of my ushers comes and sits right beside him, smiling. And he's just looking at me like, just give me the cue, just... I was concerned about even looking at him, he would consider that the cue. You know, because it, it's set up. If somebody's in here and I consider him a, a, a it's, I feel like, uh, what's his name? The Godfather, Vito. What's his name? Corleone. And, and he was so excited, he, he wanted to cast that devil out of that guy. I think he wanted to wrestle with him. But they, I said, did you believe God for this to happen? Because this doesn't happen in the church very much. But we, every, everything's important to serve. All right, get your Bibles. I better preach. I better at least give a verse. Don't you think? Okay. Well, I'm ending my, the service this morning a little early because we've got a meeting here in between and a, a lot of stuff. And, you know, I'm fragile. I've, <laughs> if I'm stretched, it, it, you know... Old Testament, 2 Kings. Chop, chop, let's go. I've been nice long enough. <laughs> Where's Ellen at? There you are. I looked and you were gone and now you're here. Is everything okay? I thought, all them kids in the nursery, Ellen's in her glory. But you didn't go in the nursery. And for the record, my tiny buddy Xander's here. I like Xander. And Xander likes me, that's... That's all we need to know, right? Second Kings, the sixth chapter. Oh, did I, I, I know it'll be on the announcements, but let me tell you, May 12th, Pastor Andrew from Kuala Lumpur will be our guest. Prophet. I don't mean increase, I mean a seer, a man who hears from God. And, and he doesn't preach like I do. And he might say, read one verse, and then he say, you, brother, back there, come up here now. <laughs> quickly, quickly. 
Quickly come. Now, I'm not saying he'll give you a prophetic word, but if you're not here, the odds are really slim. They're really. Like he's going to say, you know, the brother who's sitting in this chair, this is a word for him. Make sure he knows. Well, I'm just saying I'd be here. And, and the second thing is you'll find out how American you are. Because you are American. Okay, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Second Kings 6 chapter. Verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servant saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told them. Thus he warned them, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So the, the king of Israel gets a word from the prophet. The Syrian army will be in this location. And the king, king kind of said, mm, I'm the king, you're a prophet, but because you're a prophet, I'm going to send my, a couple of my, what are they called, recon? That's what Todd says, we'll do a recon on that restaurant. You know what that means? He's going in, I'm going to check it out for me. But in the military, that means they're going to send a spy in to gather intelligence, Okay. So he goes, and he does it once. King says, coincidence. Goes a second time, coincidence. Third time, this is not a coincidence. <laughs> May you not have to trust God three times. Okay, if you don't know him, I can understand you, but y'all know him. And so if a prophet tells you, don't drink from that water, what does that mean? <laughs> really, you don't say, who are you to tell me what to do? Anyway, I just better keep moving here. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. By what thing? Somebody, somebody's blowing the whistle. He was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servant and said to them, Will you not show me which, which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, No, none, my lord, O king, but Elijah the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Ooh la la. Now I don't see in here where his military planning session happened in his bedroom. We'll leave that one alone there. I'm just letting this sink in. God heard what the king said in his bedroom as well as in the war room. Isn't that amazing? Better be careful about what you say. That's, this, is just, this just inspires my faith. So they knew there was a prophet. So the king said, this is funny, go and see where he is that I may send and get him and it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. A, a great army? One preacher? An army? One preacher? An army? My enemy must see me different than I see myself. Your enemy must see you different than you see yourself. He didn't say send the three stooges and take him out. He got his army. And they went on a night mission. And when the servant of the man of God, the, the servant of the man of God, you mean he had an armor bearer too? He had a quarry now or a 
Benjamin Dendel or Brett Taylor. Or I can name all the guys that have served me like this. Good guys. Strong men. Raymond Wright. Todd's been great overseas. Anyway, anyway. So they... So this isn't a PSA ego kind of thing here. This prophet had a what? Do you think this prophet didn't know how to cook? You think this, this prophet was unable to dress himself? Now the joke around here is you can tell when I dress myself and when Kevy dresses me. <laughs> Guess who dressed me today? Ke really? You didn't even think about it. <laughs> Kevy? <laughs> Okay. When the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, Boss, we got trouble. We got us a situation. Alas, my master, what shall we do? Okay, who said that? And who did he say it to? The prophet, when the prophet's name was? Elijah. I, I, I believe this servant is like he was probably starting breakfast or the coffee, you know, prophets drink coffee. One time when our son Nick was in the hospital, Doc Barkley flew into Ann Arbor. And as we were taking him back to the airport, Ann Arbor is a funny little city. He said, see that Starbucks there, son? Pull over. Doc Barkley's a big coffee guy. So we park our car. We go in and get coffee, come back out. The five minutes that we were in that Starbucks and came out, we got a parking ticket. Because we parked in the no parking zone. Because Dr. Barkley said, don't worry about it. I'm a man of God. <laughs> Remember that, Kev? So we get this ticket. And Doc grumbles and says something funny and a week later, you know, we paid the ticket. We didn't just slip out of there. We paid. I get a letter from Doc Barkley, a little card. It's Open it up. There's a $50 bill in it. This is to help pay for the ticket. And he said, you should know better than to listen to the prophet when he's in the flesh. <laughs> okay, I better get going here because somebody said we're not preaching as long today but yet you keep pulling it out of me. All right, let's see. What'd the servant say? What's up? What, what are we going to do? I, and I would, I would sense he would have a little anxiety in his voice. I would think, like, this isn't a normal day. We're surrounded. Now, this prophet, verse 16, he answered, do not fear. What did he tell him? Does fear work? Could fear change the situation? Intimidation? I'm going to tell you right now, do not fear. I don't care if it's bad news, giant adversity. Don't fear. All right, there it is, but you don't have to be afraid. Okay? Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. How many was with them? An army that could surround a city. Now, I'm seeing this servant. I'm, I'm putting myself in the place of the armor bearer. He peeks his head outside of the tent and goes. That's where he calls for Trevor to add these numbers up. <laughs> and then he looks back into the tent and he sees the prophet and himself. And he goes. That's why he needed an armor bearer. He couldn't count real well. Mouth was not his strong suit. Now, what I'm about to show you is there's two prayers. Two prayers that are going to happen here, okay? What is it Elijah told his servant? Don't be afraid, man. Why, why not be afraid? So there's more with us than... And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. What did he pray? What, was this servant blind to begin with? What eyes was he talking about? His spiritual eyes. Is there a spirit realm that we don't see? You better believe it, baby, and it's as real as this realm we're in here. He said, now this isn't a deep, complicated prayer. 
Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Now, you Bible scholars, this is the second time Elijah has seen chariots of fire. When was the first time? When, when Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind. Now, this is some cool stuff. All right. Lord, open his eyes that he may see what I see and what I know. Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full, full of horses and chariots of fire around Elijah. Now, see, in, in a wild church, I'd start singing, I got a feeling everything going to be all right. I got a feeling. But since we're at New Life Victory Church, the home of the dignified we would never. <laughs> well, I saw Charity start tapping her toe. I said, I better stop. She's going to get up there. All right, what, what did Elijah pray? So he could see into the spirit realm. Lord, open all of these people's eyes. Because whether you know it or not, there's spiritual help for you. Those angels. That's pretty cool. All right, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, oh, he's praying again. Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. Now Elijah said to them, this is not the way, nor is, the way to, uh, nor is this the city. Follow me, I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. <laughs> but he led them to Samaria. He led them, they got, they got captured. He's leading this army of blind people. I pray their horses weren't blind. All right, first prayer was, Lord, do what? Can I say, my Father in heaven, open the eyes of this people, that you would be very sensitive to the spirit realm, that you'd understand that you're not alone. You might be physically alone, but you're not alone. Now, I know most of you are sweet as pie, but I know there's a couple rotten ones in here. <laughs> Not rotten? Okay, still some rough edges. Okay? Is that better? Is that better, Missy? Better that we have a couple rough edges? And when you have rough edges, sometimes you, you, you have enemies. Anybody have an enemy? Don't, don't look around, just... I mean, I'm, I'm a holy man of God. I got people that don't like me. And they want to know where I'm going, what I'm doing, how much this costs, how many times I do stuff. Isn't it silly? I pray, Lord, blind them. May they never know. I didn't curse them. I just said, may I be invisible to them. May Kevy and I just pass through. And they have, it's nunya. You know what nunya means? Oh, I didn't say it right. None ya. Man, pretty cool. Two prayers. What was the first prayer? Isn't there a prayer in the book of Ephesians that we'd have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of our God, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened? What's the second prayer? Paralyze my enemy. That's, that's what it was. Well, there's your great Bible teaching today. I learned, well, I already knew these words, but this is the first time I heard him in church. When Elijah tells you, then you'll hear. Till then, they're safe. You remember what he called the guy from Texas and the guy from New York? That's why we should buy the seat, the, the thumb drive of it, because... If it was a men's meeting, I'd say it. Maybe in the men's Bible study next Wednesday, I'll say it. But not with Charity and Ellen and Kevy and all the holy women here. You want to know? I can't do it. I, I'm sorry, I can't. I... Well, wait a minute. Dr. Barkley said it. Dr. Barkley picked on that green gray. He said, I heard there were pictures of a naked man up here last night. 
If I say this word, you'll not judge me for it, but the Marines in here will know this word. He called the guy from Texas a turd. <laughs> Is that a Marine word? Have you ever been called that word? Have you ever called another Marine that word? <laughs> Neither confirm nor deny. But I'm not calling you that. All right, stand up, please. Good gracious. Stephen did a wonderful job on that offer. Man. Did you hear the spirit of it between now and then? We can do something. And even if it, you get uncomfortable doing it. Okay? I believe everybody in here can, can do more. Right? And, I, and if you have to fast tacos... Listen, <laughs> can I cut off a finger instead? Now, listen, you know, our daughter owns that Big B in Three Rivers, and, and they financially do pretty good. She told me, she said, this blew my mind after I started being there all the time. She said, I have regular customers that it's in their their daily, weekly, and financial routine. And come in, they'll come in in the morning, they'll come in at night, they'll... And so for them to drop 20 or 30 bucks a day on, on coffee... So don't be surprised if there's a cash register out by our coffee machine. But I find out guys addicted to coffee will pay for that coffee. And I thought, are you serious? There's a guy in West Michigan that on purpose sets 30 bucks a week aside or a day for coffee? I am so nice to you guys. So I'm going to find out which one's the coffee addict and take advantage of your addiction. All right. I wanted to quit early, and I'm rambling on. Father, I bless your people today. I pray that their eyes be opened, and they're very conscious that you're working in the spirit realm in their life. And I also pray that, that our enemies who intentionally want to hurt us, defile us, hurt this church, I pray they're blinded, that they're just unaware of any movement that we're doing. And I thank you for absolute total victory in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. Kevin, I love you guys. Love you. We believe in you. Grace and peace be with you.